we were doing everything for the first time. That, that's the really interesting thing. Um, and I learned subsequently that the NZBC had really tried to buy into the Press Association domestic news service, but the Press Association and all the proprietors of all the newspapers turned them down. So then they had, they had to set up their own, which finally competed directly with the NPA, of course. I was working for Andrew Shaw's grandfather, Pop Shaw, who'd come from the Auckland Star, and a guy called Rod Melville who'd appealed at him against them. So they had two people at the opposite end of the newsroom. One was the chief reporter and one was the bulletin editor. If one wouldn't let you do something, you went to the other one. <laughs> the Viz News, international news, arrived in Auckland f because it arrived on the international aircraft, but it was put into a must-go bag and flown to Wellington because we weren't allowed to watch it in Auckland. It was flown to Wellington where it was duplicated, shown in Wellington that night, and then sent to, back to Auckland the next day. So by that, whatever overseas news you got, it was at least two days before, after it arrived in New Zealand. Um, for example, the Wahine storm, Auckland never saw that day. We, we tend to forget that South Island only saw it because somebody drove up into the hills and managed to pick up the Wellington transmission, but Auckland never saw it. it, never, it just, it's a famous film, but, but in fact, most of the country never saw it that night. And I refused to do an assignment list. We wouldn't have an assignment list. We'd have, a, we'd have an editorial meeting at 8 o'clock in the morning, by which time everybody's supposed to have listened to the radio and read the newspapers. And they would tell me what they were going to do today. And if they didn't know, we'd adjourn the meeting and call it again in half an hour. Um, and that actually worked remarkably well with that team of people from Rob Hardy and Kevin Milne and, and um, oh, Richard Long and a whole range of... of yeah, that was Chris Harrington. We had a police reporter called Graham Booth, who's still alive, but um, retired now. But he, I used to say to him, I don't actually ever want to see you in the newsroom, but don't tell me there's a major police story that we haven't got. And he just went. And it, it worked very well. It was a very tight little team. So it was a bit, it was really trying to bring the principles of management that I'd seen with Cronkite and co working in the States into, into a, into, a, into this little country, and it wasn't the BBC hierarchy that was awful. It was just, I guaranteed that I never wanted to work in Britain. <laughs> that famous interview with Muldoon, with Simon and Muldoon in different places in a remote interview, was a classic example of all the mistakes a production could ever make of, having, of giving the politician the, the questions in advance, of being in a remote location where you don't have complete control because the people are talking over each other and they, they don't see each other and whatever. And a young upstart who was desperate to try and prove that he was better than the Prime Minister. And a Prime Minister who was desperate to prove this, put this little boy down um, and, and sort out Television One at the same time. He had no liking for Television One. Um, so it was interesting really that Simon went on to become PR for the Queen and is now PR for the Confederation of British Industry or something. But uh, he was um, a little rabble raiser in his time. What we had was a little episode of a couple of hours on morning television on Saturday mornings. And by the time we finished five years later, we were running two or three hours a day, seven days a week, profitably. Um, we were totally costed, unlike most of the rest of television. We had to pay for the airtime, we had to pay for the transmission time, we had to da -da -da -da, whatever. Um, but we raised an awful lot of money and, and ran an awful lot of things that commercial television could not do. Um, from Maori language classes, English language, uh, French language classes. We ran the first Mandarin language classes in New Zealand on television. And the only thing that stopped it in the end was that um, they brought in two Australians to work at Mike Latin and Chris, you know, what's his name again, Chris Anderson, um, to work at how TV and TV could be sold. And they, I remember Mike Latin saying, would I buy ETV? And I had to say, it's not a standalone operation. It sits within another organisation and, and fills a valuable niche, but, but, but there's no sign of enough money to, to make it work on its own. So we ran what was called the Knowledge Breakfast. We were half a dozen programmes from six to nine on a Saturday morning. Um, and we got the Ministry of Education involved, we got the university departments involved, we got some secondary schools involved. Um, but the most important thing was um, was barely recognised at the time by anybody, and even to some extent by me. Um, one of my colleagues, Gresham Bradley, pushed the TVNZ um, distribution service to, to add 
online live distribution to the, to the television program. And that went out across the country online and it was through, I think, somewhere in, in Marlborough. Um, we fed the broadcast to them and they pushed it out on, online on the then internet network. Um, and that was the first online parallel broadcast in the country. And it, look where we are now, where that is actually, the, where, if television goes anywhere, it probably goes there. <laughs> yeah. it, was just, it was just extraordinary. So, so the thing I'm proudest about is actually pushing new things and trying new things. Mm. His whole family circumstances were quite complicated and there were vested interests in a book that had been published and in the widow's story and a legal challenge from, from that side of the family as to whether Billy's story could be told. And also trying to get people to understand that he was not a divisive character. The maze was extraordinary. And the development of him as, as a performer from, from, a, from a, a guitar playing, shy guitar playing little man, to somebody who was able to actually talk to the country in a way that very few people were able to talk across all sorts of... It was amazing. He, he was the nearest I ever came to seeing a real performer. And, and my fascination with Kiri at the moment is partly similar. It's, it's the sacrifices, the dedication, the determination that a performer has that when those lights go on, you move into a different mental space. And he was like that. It was fascinating. I've been fascinated by Kiri since I was 18. She is internationally the most well-known Maori name in history. She is one of the most internationally famous New Zealanders of all time. Edmund Hillary climbed Everest once with a support cast of about 2,000. She's been on the top of her game in the world for about 40 years. You know, it's an extraordinary story, but she doesn't help herself the way she tells it. And with Tom Parkinson, who's the co-producer, and I finished up coming up with the idea of putting her in masterclass, and we've seen her in masterclass with students, where, where she stops talking about herself and talks about singing and talks to the students about how they can be better singers, the challenges they're going to face, da 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 And in doing that, she reveals herself in a way that when you put an interviewer in front of her, she shuts up and the goo comes down and the plastic shield goes up and she's the, the diva being careful not to get caught out saying things she shouldn't, which the, the interviewers always push her to try and do. So, so that's what it is. It's about trying to look at what makes, what makes a world-class... And it could be Valerie Adams. What, make, what makes a world-class performer? What are the sacrifices, the dedications, the loneliness? All of those things, and it happens to be an opera singer, and it happens to be one of the best known opera singers in the world. We ought to have a television system that is not totally commercially driven. Um, I call it the, um, uh, the mental lobotomy of the nation. Um, it, it forces us to think only about things that the advertisers want, and, and, and television as a medium or on screen distribution as a medium um, is much more important than that. My whole career has been based on saying that actually it's more important than print. It's more natural than print. Uh, we don't have to spend hundreds of year, or, uh, years and years and years teaching people how to write um, because they just talk the way they learnt to talk to their mum and their dad and whatever. Um, now, of course, it's far more complex than that, but, but it is much more a human more form of communication than books or newspapers or magazines.